Welcome everybody. It's fantastic to have so many of you come down today for this session with Chris Bogues, uh, who is going to be uh, imparting his wisdoms on uh, the understated art of artwork photography and documentation. Now, before we begin, of course, we'd like to respectfully recognize that we're coming here today on the unceded lands of the Bunurong and Bunwurong people of the Kulin Nation, and Linda wishes to pay respects to elders past and present and to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Okay, just to give a quick introduction to Chris, Chris is a photographer, artist and educator based in Narm, Melbourne. His art incorporates elements of photography, video and installation, using these mediums to create glitches by manipulating the hardware and software of image-based systems. He has a keen interest in the history of digital imaging technology and how photographs and videos drive our understanding of and participation in the modern world. Outside of his personal practice, Chris works as a photographer in the field of artwork and exhibition documentation, photographing for clients in a number of galleries and studios across Melbourne. Within this work, he photographs art of all mediums and captures images in several different styles from documentation that tells the story of how an artwork inhabits a space to technically perfect renditions of one-off pieces that can be later used to recreate reproductions. Chris teaches at RMIT where he specializes in alternative and experimental photography and in his own business, Kindred Cameras, focusing on the more traditional aspects of photos and videos. Thank you so much for joining us today, Chris. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. And welcome everybody, take it away. Cheers. Uh, Hey everyone, how are you doing? Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands um, on which we're meeting today. Uh, I did have the name of the, yeah, the Liuk uh, Ut Wilan clan of the Burung nation um, and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so we just heard a little bit of a spiel about myself. Um, I, I will sort of maybe elaborate a little bit uh, I'm a man who does many different things. I'm an artist, a photographer. I spend a lot of my time teaching, uh, mainly at RMIT as well. Um, if you want to see more of my stuff, you can catch it uh, at those links there. But um, you're not really here today to hear so much about me as an artist. You want to know about me as a photographer. Uh, and the photography that I specialize in is the very niche area of artwork and gallery documentation uh, wasn't something I'd uh, particularly dreamed of doing when I was getting into cameras 15 years ago, but as an artist who worked in photography and had a camera, you know, you just sort of get asked to do photos for people and then before you know it, it ended up being a, a career for me. We're gonna talk about a couple of kinds of specific photography today. But if I was going to break the, what, the kind of photography I do down into um, to four different categories, one would be gallery documentation, uh, which is probably what I do for maybe 30 to 40% of my work. Um, it's going in and photographing exhibitions that artists have. Uh, they use those photographs for things like grant proposals, put on their websites, put on social media. Uh, I often say that these kind of images are more important than the exhibition itself because the exhibition might be seen by you know, dozens or, if you're lucky, hundreds of people, where the photos get disseminated throughout the world and potentially could be seen by thousands, you know, tens of thousands. Um, so it's really, really important that artists get good photos of the work that they put into because without the photos, it's like it didn't really exist. You know, the photos act as proof that this thing has happened. Uh, the gallery documentation can really be broken down into two kinds of shots. Um, corner shot, so something like we see on the left hand side here, it has a bit of depth to it, and a front on shot, which will show the artwork on the walls. And normally what I would do is do something like a photograph from every corner of a space and then photograph each of the walls individually. Sometimes artists want each of the individual works done too. Uh, it really depends on what they ask for and what their budget is. The other kind of really common photograph and the other big chunk of the work I do is for catalogue photography. 
Uh, so people who are wanting photos of their artworks to put in a print catalogue, if they've got an exhibition in a commercial gallery or something like that, uh, maybe they just want some nice close-up photos of their artworks for their website too. Uh, this is a little bit less exciting to do as a photographer because you know the exciting part's already happened and that's the artwork. I'm just there to, to make that artwork really sing. Um, but really important for people to have good photos so that people can clearly see what the um, things like the paintings look like without maybe necessarily being there too. Those are the two kinds of photography we're really going to focus on today. So the, the catalogue style shot and the gallery style shot. Um, the other two kinds of photography that I do are reproduction photography. Uh, it'll be a bit of a stretch to achieve something like this with a smartphone because it involves really high megapixel camera, uh, use of flash, use of a technique called cross polarization, which Theoretically, it could probably be done on a smartphone, but not something that I've attempted before. And the, the work for this is a lot more involved. You know, it can typically take me 30, 45 minutes to set up a light to do something like reproduction work because of the level of care that's needed. Uh, it can be a little bit less strict when we're doing general photography for catalogs and galleries. Um, the other kind of photography that I do often is portraits. And I just want to mention this too because artists never take enough photos of themselves with their artworks. And I think it's really important because you know, almost every time that I've had to do something, like even for this talk, I got asked for a headshot. And artists, they, they, they're so focused on getting their artwork photographed, they forget to photograph themselves. Um, but something like this, getting a nice photo of yourself in your studio or in the gallery, come in, it's how you're right. Um, super, super important and shouldn't be overlooked either. So what we're going to talk about today is specifically to smartphones. Uh, and the smartphones are fairly capable of taking good photos in the right conditions. Um, general principles of photography is all about light. So you think of the same principles if we're using a smartphone to if I'm using my $5,000 camera. You know? It's all to do with how we use the light and how we can capture that light in the best possible way. Um, keeping expectations realistic will help if you're using a smartphone. You know, like don't expect to be able to do reproduction prints of a one by one meter painting or something like that with a photo you've taken an hour for. Um, but putting it in a catalog, printing it, you know, this size, totally doable. Putting it on Instagram, looking at that size, totally doable. Website, totally doable. Uh, so knowing what you can and you can't do will save you from being disappointed and also help you direct your energy towards something that will be a, uh, a better use of your time. The intent of artwork documentation, in my mind, is to capture a balance between accuracy, so accurately capturing colours, contrast, tones, textures, all those important things within artwork, um, but it's not necessarily about being completely accurate. There is some of the experience of viewing that comes into play as well. And a story I always think about with this is uh, one that a, a photographer or an old photographer from the NGV told me. And he was talking about this time where he was photographing one of the paintings in the NGV and did this really technically accurate capture of this painting um, for a publication. And then he sent it off to uh, his boss or the director or something for approval and they hated the photo. Uh, and the reason they hated it was because the painting had been shown under really warm gallery lights. And so everyone was seeing it under these really warm light conditions. And then when a photographer comes in and photographs it under neutral light, with really even lighting, all of a sudden the colour and the experience of viewing the artwork changes. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, bit, uh, a bit art and a bit science when it comes to photographing. And probably leans a little bit more to the science for this sort of things, but you, you can't, you, you gotta go with your gut sometimes. And I do that when I'm editing to try and bring out the, the most of the images. So we're gonna talk about where and what conditions to photograph the artwork in. And the two that we're really gonna talk about is using natural light, so something like a window light or some sort of artificial light. Uh, I have brought in an LED that is expensive and um, probably not something that you'll have, but uh, we're going to use that as a stand-in for like, you know, a, a desk lamp or something like that that you could buy from money, something cheap and easy. 
Uh, we're gonna talk about how to take the photo. I'll do a bit of a live demo. Um, there is an app that I use called Lightroom that will be the, the best thing to do this kind of photography in. Photography is always a bit of a, a compromise as well, so we'll talk about that. You get something in one part, you lose it in another. So learning how to balance those compromises to get the best photo possible is really important. And we will also talk a little bit about editing if we have the time. Uh, I, yeah, with these things I never really know how much content I've got to go for, so could be a lot, could be a little, um, but we'll see how we go. Now, uh, just want to talk about some equipment and I'm conscious of the fact that if you're shooting with your smartphones, you're probably trying to keep costs down, you know? Uh, there are some things that will make your life a lot easier though, without too much of an investment in. We're talking, you know, to get all this stuff, maybe around $200, um, 300 perhaps, maybe you can do it for 150 but fairly low investment, but for high return. Uh, first one is a tripod, and that's the one that I absolutely wouldn't compromise on. Uh, it's really, really, really useful to have a tripod, and you'll see once we start shooting, there are just some things that are really kind of impossible to do without one. Uh, I'll show you, actually, I'll just skip to the next slide. I did a little quick look on Amazon for you to find something suitable. Something like this tripod here, I think, looks pretty good. Um, goes up fairly tall, has a phone holder that rotates, about 65 bucks. So, you know, if you're not gonna buy anything else on that list, something like that tripod there uh, will let you get much, much better photo than what you'd be getting handheld. Looks very cheap. I know, really cheap, yeah. Tiny, it? Uh, that one, well, it says 160 centimeters, so that sounds fairly tall. I uh, actually find you don't really need to go that tall with artwork documentation. Uh, reason being, like if I'm doing a gallery shot, the camera is actually normally around about this level here. Mm -hmm. And then if you're photographing a painting on the wall, you can always just hang it lower or get a lower plinth or lower table to put an object on. So um, yeah, I, I, like, I think that would be fairly good. It's not one I've used personally. Like, I, I have a much more expensive tripod myself. Um, but yeah, I mean like my tripod I think cost me about 600 bucks when I got it, but you know, I've had it for 15 years. So, you know, you break it down to a yearly cost. Uh, you used it a lot. Yeah, uh, but it, it's overkill for phone photography as well. You know, it's designed to hold a two or three kilo camera. Um, so, yeah, something like that, go a long way. Another thing is a grey card. So a grey card is something that we use in photography to neutralize the color of a light source. All right, that's what it looks like here. Um, so, for example, these fluoros have a particular colour tone to them. Judging from looks around us, it's kind of like a warm white, I would say. Uh, window light will have a different colour of light too. Uh, sunlight has a different colour of light. All light sources are different colours. Uh, we want to capture colours accurately. And so I use something like this to, to balance out the colour of whatever light source I'm using. Is this instead of a particular shade of grey. It is, it is. The brownish and the tinge which yeah, it's so, um, so this is something where you probably don't want to go cheap and cheerful. You want to buy something decent. Um, the two best brands are Data Color, which is this one here. So Data Color and Color Spell to the American Color Spelling. And the other one, uh, they just changed their name recently. I think it's called Calibrite, C-A-L-I-B-R. ITE. Uh, you can get cheap, you know, ten, fifteen dollar grey cards, but if they're not neutral, perfectly neutral, then they're kind of useless anyway. Um, so that's something I would kind of get the, the name brands for. I'll show you how to use them when we, we start to shoot. Another thing, this is one of the secrets of the tray. This is for anyone who is photographing works pine glass, so frame drawings, frame photos, all that sort of thing. A black That's sheet. Hard. It's really hard during glass. It is hard, but this is my secret here. A yeah. black sheet with a hole cut out in the middle of it. All right. <laughs> and what you do is you hold this up in front of the thing with behind the glass, and you put your camera through the little hole, and this black sheet blocks out all the reflections. So I've got some example slides using that. Uh, it's amazing. The camera works. Really. Yeah. So you poke the lens through that hole. Um, yeah, you know, that's just a cheap one from Kmart. 
I can't remember how much it cost me, but I've had it for probably five or six years and it seems to be the trick. I probably should have bought it maybe a bit of a higher thread count in hindsight, but uh, it, um, it goes all right. Uh, the other thing there is a reflector or a diffuser. And here one is. So we'll talk a bit about these sorts of things when we get to the actual photos. There's some ways you can DIY stuff for this as well. But this is what a photographic reflector looks like. Really the ones that we're interested in for artwork documentation aren't silver and gold, um, but white, one side is white. Um, and then this here. Why they white and so white reflects a neutral diffuse light back, whereas silver reflects a specular light back. Uh, generally, silver light <coughs> isn't great for a reflector um, for doing this kind of work. The other thing they are is something called a diffuser, and I'll show you that with this in a bit. This is like a sort of translucent material that's used to soften the light, make it more, um, make the light source larger, and also make it more diffuse. Some other things I use all the time too are just some black and white card from Officeworks. Okay, uh, so probably not perfectly neutral, so keep that in mind when you're buying these sorts of things. Uh, but these are really good for photographing things like objects where you're wanting to create a little bit of a reflection or reflect a little bit of light or block a bit of light because you can just sit them on the table and you don't have to hold them in your hand. The circular reflectors can get a little bit unwieldy sometimes. Uh, but we'll come back to all that stuff once we actually start looking at some photos. And that's the Lightroom app there. Uh, I think it's called Adobe Lightroom Photo. They keep changing the name. It used to be Adobe Mobile, <coughs> maybe Adobe Lightroom Photo Editor. That's the icon though. So I um, should say at the start, like if you want to take any photos of these slides while I'm talking as well, uh, feel free to. Does it does quite a few different things. Uh, you can catalogue and organise your images, which is really useful. It's got a much more advanced camera than what your dedicated phone camera has, and it also has an editing part of it as well, which is really, really handy. All right, so before we get into taking the actual photos, let's talk about some of the principles of light. So general rule, is that brighter is better. Uh, brighter light will allow us to choose more favourable settings on our smartphones. It's not to say that you can't take photos in dull light, it just gets more difficult. And there is a limitation with smartphones where you can't, can't take a photo for longer than about a second. So you will get to a point where you sort of hit a hard limit to the, um, the amount that you can compensate on your phone for the brightness of the light source that you're using. Uh, neutral light is best, so if you're gonna buy a lamp or something to photograph your artworks with, get a daylight uh, 5600, 5500 Kelvin bulb, something like that. If you're buying fluoros for your gallery, uh, for your studio, something like that will be better. Uh, if you're photographing in the middle of the day, then um, uh, photographing with sunlight, then generally in the middle of the day is about the best time to do it. So out of curiosity, I was meant to ask this at the start. Um, I'm curious to know what mediums you're all working in, because I assume you're artists. Uh, who, who are like two-dimensional mediums, paintings, drawings, that sort of thing? Yeah, and any object-based stuff? Great. I, I went to the studio last night and did a whole heap of photos on object-based things because these are our old slides that from a workshop around a couple of years ago. I'm glad there's quite a few of you in the room. I feel like that time was well spent now. Um, the other thing to be mindful of, so neutral light is best, but light also reflects the colour of a surface. Uh, I found this when I was putting together these slides originally I was using a window at home, this is during lockdown, and uh, we have a balcony with these really, really big bay windows. And uh, it looks like it would be the perfect place to take photos in, but we have these sort of gray blue tiles on the balcony, and those gray blue tiles are actually reflecting blue light back into the room. Uh, 
it wouldn't be so much of a problem if it was reflecting blue light across the entirety of the room, but what it was doing was it was creating this kind of line where half the light was warm, half of it was blue, and that mixed lighting is a real nightmare to deal with. Uh, so uh, at the very least, you want your lighting to be evenly coloured, even if it can't be perfectly neutral, because if it's evenly coloured, we can fix it with the grey card. If you've got two different colours of lights, then it gets a lot more difficult because you fix, fix it for one, you throw the other one off. And uh, it can be done, it just gets more complicated. The other useful principle to know is that light travels in straight lines. So for the people who are photographing and works behind glass, we use this principle as well in order to remove reflections. Uh, and it's, I guess, also relevant for object-based stuff too. Uh, but we'll keep going a little bit more before we get to that. So we're going to talk through a couple of different kinds of light sources, choosing your location. Um, does anyone have natural light in their studio? Show of hands. A few of you, everyone else working under fluoros? Yeah. Yeah, because I, I got like one fluoro in my studio and it's pretty atrocious. <laughs> However, you know, there are spaces, like a lot of galleries these days do this sort of setup here where they just put fluoros across the length of the wall and they're really, really great to photograph in because they've just got completely clean, even lighting. Uh, so it makes my job a lot easier shooting in spaces like that. Um, fluoros can be good or bad. Hopefully what you'll, you'll learn from today is you'll sort of learn to be more observant of the light that you're shooting in and then you can kind of make those judgment calls a little bit better yourself as to whether it's working or not working. Uh, we're also going to talk about the angle to put the light at. Often people put the lights in front, thinking that's going to give you the most even, brightest illumination. It's the worst place to put it, though. Uh, so we'll learn that pretty quickly. Uh, we're going to talk about brightness, which we've already sort of talked about. Brighter is better. Um, size of light source. This is particularly important for the object-based artists. The size of the light source is really going to dramatically change the look of your object. Uh, we'll also talk about distance as well. Uh, distance is one of those places where there's a fair bit of compromise. The further you move a light source, the more even your illumination will be, but the darker the light will be. So you've sort of got to decide, like my general rule of thumb is move it as far back as possible while still leaving the light as bright as I need it to be. And you know, there's a bit of give and take in that relationship. The background of an artwork is more for catalogue sort of stuff. You know, like classic white is really what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I think white can look a little bit old fashioned, you know, um, particularly if you're doing something for social media. A lot of artists are using nice sort of pastel colours or blocky poppy colours, uh, which are a lot more eye catching for those who, you know, you're scrolling through a feed and you're trying to capture someone's attention in a tenth of a second. Uh, a bright red is probably going to do that more than a, a grey or a white. Um, but we're going to focus on the, the sort of classic catalogue style shot today. The surrounding environment we've talked a little bit about before. Um, things that are maybe less obvious and that I notice in my studio is I've got a white wall studio. And if I want to photograph in there, I need to put up, I've got a couple of those black sheets, but I actually put that up over the wall uh, because those walls reflect light and it makes it hard for me to control the light. Uh, if I want to reflect light, then I'll add something else in that does that. I don't want that just happening sort of randomly off one of the walls. Okay, so let's start with natural light. It is, we've got two choices. Uh, typically window lights is probably what you're dealing with. Sunlight can work well for object-based stuff. And there is a, definitely a real style at the moment for hard lights, which you get with direct sunlight. You take something outside, photograph it. Um, using a studio cost that's kind of set up but in the direct sun. Uh, probably won't be doing that for paintings though, or particularly if you're shooting with really large works, you'll be using something like window light, which is soft. Um, if you don't understand what hard and soft means yet, that's okay because I'll, I'll show you some photographic examples of that. Uh, typically I would say for 2D works, hard light works better. And for object-based works, uh, soft to medium soft or medium hard works better, but we'll see some photos of it. Uh, the best thing about natural light is it's free, so you know, that keeps the budget down. <laughs> and uh, I'm an artist myself, I, I know how expensive making art can be, so wherever you can save a couple of bucks is a good thing. 
Um, you're also limited to the time that you can shoot. And this would be a real problem for me because you know I'm typically teaching or taking photos myself like between those nine to five hours. If you're working jobs too, then kind of limits your photography to your days off and also around about that 10 till two o'clock period in the middle of the day. Uh, the color and brightness changes. Obviously it's darker at sunrise and sunset. Uh, the color is warmer at sunrise and sunset too. Even a couple of hours after sunrise or a couple of hours before sunset, it will be slightly warm. Uh, 5500 Kelvin, which is your sort of neutral point, is around about the middle of the day, and we've talked about reflecting colours already. Artificial light, you will typically have fluoros. Uh, you'll have, I mean, I don't know how many people really have incandescent lights anymore, but uh, they're probably the one thing you don't want to shoot under because they're crazy warm. Uh, and then you've got LED bulbs, which are kind of the most common thing now. Uh, they're typically dark. Uh, compared to like a nice large window and they typically have small coverage and so a, a lamp shoots out a cone of light and that cone is fairly small while it's still in that optimal brightness range. You can pull it further back but it gets dark very very quickly. Uh, this is where you want to make sure that you're choosing daylight bulbs, 5500 Kelvin bulbs and you're not mixing bulbs. All right. So if I'm shooting in my studio, I'll be making sure any light that's not a light that I know the Kelvin rating of is turned off, okay? I don't want that affecting my images. Uh, and maybe, I guess, when we do the demo stuff, we might be able to turn the overhead lights off because I would just want to make sure that I'm using that single light source. That's the one that I'll calibrate for. Or I guess I could use the fluoros and leave that one off, but I wouldn't want to mix. And also got to be careful of light reflecting colors off the environment. Keep a nice clean area, you know, don't have a really big one by one and a half meter red painting right next to the painting that you're photographing. Move it away, make it white, neutral or black really works best. Okay, so let's look at 2D artworks to start with. We talked before that light travels in a straight line. There's this rule of photography that angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. That just means that the angle that a light hits a surface, it will bounce off at the same angle, okay? On a perfectly flat surface. Uh, so things like glass, really, really important. You know, flat texture, uh, minimal paintings, important too. Uh, even matte surfaces, you know, things like, um, for example, like a matte paint or a pencil drawing, stuff like that, which seems relatively matte, is still glossy and reflective, and will still reflect something called specular reflections back, which are those ugly big white bits um, that you've probably seen before. Uh, so poor light positioning is really the, the key thing that makes bad reflections and then bad photographs. And I said it right back at the start, um, you really want your light to be coming from the side rather than in front. So this is the photo I was talking about um, before uh, that I did for this workshop during lockdown. Got a nice big window to the side of the artwork. Uh, and yeah, color wise it didn't work out very well, but illumination wise it was pretty good. So this is just a side by side example of light coming from in front of the artwork or behind the photographer. So taking the photo, you know, on that wall there with this light behind me. <coughs> And this is a photo with the light coming from the side, like we saw in that slide just before there. Uh, and this is a very matte painting as well, but you'll notice the photo on the left-hand side, we've got lots of color, lots of contrast. Uh, I don't know how easy to see, but there's also some kind of uh, specular kind of highlights in here, particularly in some of the darker bits. And all that stuff just gives the, the painting a really washed out, dull look. You know, I, I could probably uh, bring that back a bit in the editing stage, but if I can just eliminate it when I'm taking the photos, it's a much, much better solution. And it's just a simple matter of putting the photograph, um, putting the light source to the side there. Uh, when we get to editing, there are two kind of ways you can approach it. You could leave white space around the painting, or you could just crop straight to the borders. Uh, if you want to leave white space around the painting, the problem with having light off to the side is that your shadow goes off to the right or left. Generally, we like shadows to go downwards. 
Easy solution to that is just you photograph the painting on its side. Okay, so you turn that 90 degrees, take the photo, rotate it back in post-production, and all good. You got the best of both worlds then. Reflect, oh yeah, sure. What about so taking outdoors from the sun? Is it the same thing? The sun's behind you, you can see there's light behind Yes, yeah, so sun is probably a closer example to this because this that's a soft light source that we were just talking about, whereas the sun is a hard light source, like these lamps. Uh, and again, putting those lamps in front of the artwork, these are the, when I say specular reflections, these are the things I'm talking about, these big, bright white bits, look super ugly. Just by moving those lamps off to the side so that the angle is more severe with the surface of the glass, completely eliminates that problem, okay? So, really, really straightforward, really easy, all to do with vision. If you've got one light source window like this, how do you stop the, like, the gradation of it's a great question, we're going to get there, yeah, we're going to get there. Um, but even illumination is, is probably one of the more difficult th things to do without this equipment, um, without expensive equipment, because normally I would use like multiple light sources. What did you call illumination? Even, even oh, illumination, right. yeah. yeah. Uh, Alright, so I've already sort of revealed the trick to this, but we saw my big black sheet before. Uh, this is a way of shooting with window light or big soft light sources and removing all those reflections. Photo on the left hand side is just the thing that you would normally see without the sheet. Photo on the right hand side oh, yeah. is holding up the sheet in front of it. And okay. that's what it looks like there. They've both got glass on them. They've both got glass, so yeah. Show yeah. Up on them. yeah, so um, pretty amazing <laughs> that you know a cheap sheet with a hole cut out of it <laughs> does such a good job. And it's all, I, I love taking it to jobs too. Everyone always gets a kick out of it when I pull out this big black sheet and they think I'm crazy. And I'm like, just, just wait until you see the results. Uh, this again is why it's useful having a tripod too, because trying to do this while holding the phone in your hand is gonna get pretty tricky, all right? Um, so having, a, I, 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 I don't work with an assistant, I work by myself. The tripod really is essential for being able to do this kind of stuff. So even illumination, um, which we sort of mentioned before. The two ways we'll talk about it, um, using artificial light or using uh, a window light or a large natural soft light source. Um, with artificial light, so using something like a lamp, you know, desk lamp like this, easiest way of getting even illumination is just to have two of them or more. Uh, one to either side, Identical kinds of lamps, identical bulbs, identical angles, and identical differences. All right, and what I would do is measure all that out with tape measure, so that I know everything was exact. Uh, it's a little bit harder when you've got a single light source. So if you're using a window, because you can't add in a second light source very easily, and that's when we start to need to use something like a reflector instead. So a reflector is a white surface of some kind, and you saw a couple of them. I got this big circular one. Uh, you can buy these in rectangular shapes as well. So if you have really large paintings, they go up to about 1.8 by 1.5 meters in size and they're rectangular, um, which are better for, for uh, rectangular works. But also something just like a little bit of cardboard from Office Works does the trick too. Probably get the gist there. Uh, I guess the point here is that I'm thinking, I'm not just looking at the light of the artwork, but also looking at the light around the artwork as well. And my eyes are checking the, the brightness, all those bits of white around the artwork to make sure that that's evenly illuminated. If that's evenly illuminated, then the artwork should be pretty good too. It's still gonna work with, well with pencil drawing. Pencil drawing is Yeah, if, if you get the angle severe enough, yeah, for sure. Um, it's, it's, you know, the next step beyond that would be doing the cross polarization technique that I was talking before, which is not going to to advance for what we're discussing today. Um, but you would be surprised what you can get away with just with a really severe angle and a hard light source. The hard light sources make it actually easier to remove those reflections. The large soft light sources are trickier because it's much, you know, window like this. Yeah, I've got an angle of light coming here and also an angle of light coming like that. So it's very, very hard for me to control the reflections on that. Uh, the other thing to point out here is because this is rested on a table, 
I put down a black cloth there because I don't want any light from that table reflecting back up to the work, all right? Um, that would have put a line in the glass here that wouldn't have looked very well. You know, if you, if you were shooting on a wood table, then the light coming back would be orange. Um, so cloth, black cloth down there or a black bit of cardboard, just something to neutralize that too. Uh, so this is probably more, you know, what I was getting at when I said we were gonna be talking about things. If you're using a single light source, with a light off to the left hand side and you can't add something in, that's when you start to use something like a reflector here, okay? Uh, you'll never be able to create exactly the same brightness on this side as you will on that side using just a reflector because you're always gonna have less light coming off here than you will off this point. But you can see there, you know, it's doing a pretty good job at filling in the shadows on that right hand side and getting a nice even illumination. Uh, at least for the point that I think we, we will need, you know, for doing the kind of work that we're talking about with smartphones. Um, generally, I will use my eyes to do this sort of thing. When we get into the app, I'll show you this one other little trick to help you know when you've got even illumination using one of the features of the app. So I might save that for there, but we can just look visually for now. All right, 3D artworks, going all right for time. So, Angle of an incident equals angle of reflection. Somewhat important. To be honest, I just put that photo there because I put the extra slide in this morning and didn't have another image. Um, <laughs> really, uh, the things that are most important, I think, are the, the light and size of light. That should be angle and size of light. The angle of light defines how the subject is shaped. Okay, so. You know, we're, we're living in a three-dimensional world and we're trying to translate that to two-dimensional imagery. The angle of the light determines how 3D something looks, really. We can either make it really 3D using lots of shadow, lots of highlights, or we can flatten everything out. Uh, and you've basically got, like, if I'm photographing something, uh, say my little capture stick here, and I've got a bit of white card that I'm photographing against. This is just from Office Works too. This will create a sort of seamless backdrop. Normally what I would do is tape that to the wall of my gallery, tape that to the wall uh, to the table, just keep it nice and flat and it's like a studio sort of thing. Uh, but I have about 180 degrees of choice as to where I put my light on this side, okay? Uh, it's quite subjective. Like there's not really a right or wrong here. You might prefer one place or the other. Uh, so, really the best advice I can give you is if you're photographing your objects, move the light. Put it over here, have a look at it, put it there, have a look at it. You don't even need to take a photo, just look at it with your eyes and see how the light changes as you move around. Uh, and you'll know when you get to a point that you like. The other thing is the size, which will control the softness or hardness and the diffusion of the light. Uh, we're going to increase both the size and the diffusion using our diffuser reflector thing there. That will again affect how much texture is captured. Softer light is less textural, harder light has more texture. It's gonna affect the catch lights, which are those specular highlights that we were talking about before, and also uh, affect how deep and dark the shadows are and how um, obvious the shadows are. So, got a little cactus there, just on that simple bit of white card, really, really simple setup. This would be fine for something like a gallery style shot, you know, if you're, um, if you're selling your objects, uh, putting them on a web store, e-commerce sort of thing, uh, any of that stuff there. But we've got a light coming from about 45 degrees in front compared to a light coming from maybe 20 degrees behind that object. And you can see same object with very different looks to that object, all right? Um, well, I wanted to put a light over this side, on the actual off side, I'll be honest with you. I was doing these at about 11 o'clock last night and my studio was pretty messy and I'd spent nine hours teaching at RMIT that day and so I just got to the too hard basket. But you can use your imaginations there, um, I'm sure. Now, this is using a bare bulb, so just something like that there or an equivalent would be a lamp, you know, a lamp from Bunnings like we saw before. Um, so we've got very, very hard to find lines to our shadows, very deep shadows, and we're getting lots of texture on the ripples in this cactus here. Opposite end of that is soft light. 
Okay, so soft light is created by increasing the size of the light source. Uh, more diffuse light is created by having a material like this which scatters the light. So these photos are the same position of the lights as before, but instead of just having a bare bowl holding up this diffuser between the light source and the object. Uh, and you can see a very dramatic change to the look of the cactus in those two photos. You know, in this shot here, I probably prefer the look of the cactus on the left-hand side, but in this shot here, I actually don't mind the deeper shadows with the cactus on the right-hand side. So this is where a bit of the subjectiveness comes into play. No right or wrong, just go with your gut. Go with what you like to look on. What camera are you using for these shots? My iPhone 13. Okay. Uh, another question if I might. With your smartphone, most of them are pretty well these days. Right? Yeah. People can drop them. Do you say a screen protector is a good thing or a bad thing? A uh, good thing, yeah. Um, I'd probably I, I'd be meaning to buy uh, some protective caps for my camera on it for about 12 months as well, but that's probably not a bad idea too. Uh, the screen doesn't matter so much because it's not going to affect your images. It's more the lenses on your, your camera on the back of it. They're the part that you really want to protect because if you scratch them, then it could cause you to dramas in the future. Yeah. Can I just ask, what's the best way to play in it? The camera's on your back, uh, shirt. T-shirt. Yeah, yeah. yeah t-shirt's what I use. Yeah, and you've actually, you've, you've taken my step one for when we actually get to take the photo, and that's to clean the camera lens, because uh, I find every time I pull it out of my pocket, you know, it, I seem to have fingerprints on it. I, I don't feel like I ever touch it, but they're still there. Uh, and they will, the fingerprints will um, reduce contrast in your image. You'll still get a photo, but you'll you sort of lose that punch. It's a bit of a foggy look to it. Um, here is a, another visual example for you, just looking at the change in the hardness of that light. Um, got some lighting diagrams down the bottom there, but basically got a lamp off to about 45 degrees from camera left. Uh, we've got bare bulb on the right hand side, a diffuser close to the light source in the middle, and then a diffuser close to the object on the left hand side. So the closer you move that diffuser to the object, the softer the light will be. The further you move it from the object or the closer to the light source, the harder the light will be. Um, you know, I tend to find somewhere in the middle ground is the best. If it's too soft, often things can look quite flat and boring. If it's too hard, then you get stuff like um, some ugly hatch lights up here. Hard light is kind of in vogue at the moment now in photography. So, you know, if you want to be a bit more contemporary, maybe work out a way of using hard light. Um, but yeah, somewhere like in the middle. And that's just, again, a matter of moving it back and forth, having a look at what I like the look of, and then once I find something, I'll sort of stick to it. Uh, on that note of the catch lights too, I should point out. So here, it's a little bit hard to see in the photos, but we've got very small, bright, circular catch lights, basically reflecting that, um, that small light source. And then the catch lights get bigger and less obvious as you go down. Um, so, you know, if you're photographing ceramics with really kind of shiny lasers and that sort of stuff, then you need to be conscious of those catch lights because they can look a little bit ugly. Normally just increasing the, uh, the size of the light source using a diffuser will fix that for you. All right, uh, another shot I wanted to talk about, this is kind of like a very classic shot. You know, if you were looking at NGV's collection of objects and they had a vase or something, they would photograph it like this here uh, with a gradient gray background for your object. Um, I, this, is, this is done with my phone using a bit of cardboard and diffuser and um, uh, so a bit of black card, a bit of white cardboard for the background and diffuser again. Uh, at this point, things were starting a little bit tricky, I would say. So I was basically, had the light off to the left-hand side there, and I was holding the diffuser up in front of the light source, and then reaching over with the reflector like this to create a shadow on the background. Um, I think this is probably the one photo that would be pretty difficult to do without something like a light stand. Uh, if you can get your light higher, so you could use a normal lamp to do this, but having a lamp on the desk at the same height as the light source, I think um, <coughs> it's gonna look a bit tricky. However, I do have a, a compromise for you, another solution. 
and that's to take a similar photo with a grey background but without that gradient and just instead have a hard line. Um, I would argue that this look is actually more contemporary because uh, uh, I can't, I, I don't know, I, I thought I would not like this shot but then I do kind of like it now that I look at it. Um, but in, uh, in a lot of sort of ceramics that I see, it's like hard lines um, and often some colours thrown in there too. Uh, to achieve this, this is still using a white bit of paper in the background, but you can actually change the brightness of that paper by moving everything further away from it. Uh, and what I mean by that, so if we look at two setups, one on the left hand side, we have all in both of them, we have the same setup as far as object, diffuser, light, okay? None of that changes. The only thing that changes is by moving this further away from the background, the background gets darker. Uh, if you've got enough space in your studio, you will actually be able to make the white background black by moving it further and further away. Um, because as light travels over distance, it decreases in brightness, so the more we increase this distance, the darker that gets. Because nothing stays here, this stays the same, okay? Um, so that would be very achievable to do with a table, a bit of white card for, your, um, uh, for the table here, lamp off to the left, some sort of diffusion material in two, and just moving it forwards and backwards. You kind of get a sort of big motion tilting the card back, so it kind of goes off into the distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's um, like, it's kind of like this shot here, uh, but you need, you need a very long yeah. card um, to do that. If, I would say, like, what's the size of my bit of paper here? Like, this is the biggest you can get it from um, Officeworks. Like, this kind of looks big relative to this thing here, but this was just big enough to photograph this. Um, really, I'd probably want a bit of paper four times this size to give me some more wiggle room. And once you get to that point, you're probably just better off buying a, a roll of, you know, white um, photo backdrop, normally come in one and a half by sort of 12 or 15 meters in size and just using that. Tear off as much as you need, use it for as long as it still looks good and then tear off another bit. Um, and then, you know, if you had the space, you could unravel it 10 meters and, uh, and get a really nice even fall off. Um, cool, all right, so, got 10 minutes or so, we, had, we need to leave a little bit of time. I've sort of, we've sort of been doing questions as we go, so I suppose I can uh, maybe go an extra five minutes. Um, but I'm gonna actually show you the app now, the Lightroom app, because it's a little bit more advanced than what your normal camera app is. Um, so there are a couple of tricks to it. Uh, I'm just gonna go through these slides here. I'm gonna show you how to do all this stuff again, but I thought I would put it on the screen. So if you wanna take photos of, um, the steps and the places to find all those steps. Go for it, I'll just leave this up for 10 or so seconds. Um, so we're gonna turn off the flash. Flash comes from the front, we don't want that. We're gonna change quality to DNG, which is a digital negative, a raw file. Um, difference between DNG and JPEGs, which is what your phone would typically capture, is JPEG has 16 million colors, DNG is gonna have about four trillion. So uh, quite a significant difference in color, and that is a good thing. It's a good thing for when we're photographing paintings with colour, but also DNGs and RAWs capture gradients like this a lot better. Uh, what you might find if you're trying to do this shot with a JPEG is that you get something called banding, where it doesn't have enough variation in tone and you get these kind of stripes um, in the background, which is kind of ugly. Uh, then we click the three dots, turn on the self-timer. So a couple of reasons why we want to do that. Self-timer uh, allows us, if, if we press the camera and it shakes a bit, the self-timer will just give it a second to settle before it goes off. Um, the other thing is, if you need to hold up your big black sheet, then you want that self-timer to give you a chance to press the button and then hold it up. Um, the grid is useful for if you're photographing 2D artworks like this, because it just, just helps as a reference to <coughs> get the object, um, sorry, to get the, the 2D artwork um, square. We can fix this a little bit in post-production too. Highlight clipping, that's my trick for showing when I've got even illumination. I'll show you what that actually looks like in a tick. Um, turn on professional mode. If you've got a telephoto lens, your telephoto lens will typically have a, a nicer looking uh, angle of view than what your, your standard or your wide angle lens will have. Um, the telephoto lens is less distorted. So it will, um, 
It will make things look like less sort of wonky, I guess, and more square. Um, the eyedropper tool, we're going to use that for doing our white balance. So we can set this in camera. Normally what I do too is actually take a photo of the grey card and I do a double check when I get into the editing stage as well. Um, so yeah, do it one camera and then you also take a photo of it. And then this is our clipping thing here. So this helps us know if we've got even illumination. Basically, if we get to a point where we can see this around all the edges of the painting, then it should be even illumination, okay? So it's a nice little um, trick of the trade there too. Then we're going to set the lowest, eyes about, the lowest ISO value. That will give us the cleanest, crisp image possible. Uh, we're going to change the shutter speed. To, we're going to slow the shutter speed down. We'll probably shoot around about you know, anywhere between like half to a tenth of a second, which again, very, very hard to do that handheld. That's why we want the tripod. Uh, and then we'll bring it back a switch. And we'll look at that exploitative. Okay. I am very happy that this is still connected. So this is the Lightroom app here. Um, this will be the screen that you'll probably be presented with when you first open the app and the little camera icon that we're interested to start with, okay? So I'm going to click on that and maybe I will, I'm just going to, you know, line in everyone's face and also, anyway, maybe we'll just use natural light and see how we go. Um, but now we can see on my screen there, let's pop this in the tripod and we'll just photograph this cactus here uh, with some natural light and with all of you in the background. <laughs> Just so we get the idea. Alright, so pretty dark at the moment. We'll deal with that in a tick. Let's just go through all those things I talked about before. So flash is already off. That's good. If I click in the middle here, I got the options of DNG. Oh. DNG and JPEG. I've got to set the DNG at the moment. Click my three dots in the right hand side. And there I've got my. It's a bit of a lag. Is this in Lightroom? Or is this, this, is, this is in Lightroom. This is in Lightroom. Yeah, so but the good thing about Lightroom is you can just stay in Lightroom okay. from image capture to organization to editing. Yeah, it's a really nice system to use once you get wrap your head around it. Yeah. Uh, we've got self timer. Our grid and our highlight clipping through the top there. Pro camera turn down the bottom, telephoto lens. So we're pretty much good. I'm going to set my self timer to maybe five seconds, a little bit more reasonable. Um, but we're pretty much right now to actually try and start getting our exposure, all right, to work out the brightness. And actually, I have an idea. Will this all be on YouTube? Yes. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, oh, I'm not sure where the video of this is going. Um, it's going on YouTube. YouTube. Yeah, it will be on YouTube. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, and there will be like a million other tutorials on Lightroom as well. It's the industry standard for, for doing photo photography. Yeah. Um, so you'll be able to find the. <coughs> Can you still see? Yes. You can. Okay. Cool. Let's put that there. Now we've got a quasi sort of studio setup. All right, so first thing I'm gonna do is my white balance. Where is my gray card? And lights are ready too, which makes it easy. Won't worry about that one in the back. So I'm gonna click on this little eyedropper tool down here. And then I'm gonna click on the eyedropper again on the right hand side. And then it says, fill view with a neutral surface. This is our neutral surface. Okay, so I'm going to hold that in front of that square there and click the tick and then that's all set. That's done. Really, really easy, but now that light has been <coughs> neutralized. It should be white. The next thing I'm going to do is go to my ISO here. It's already set to 25, but I just want that to be the lowest number it can be. It might be different on your phones. Has anyone heard of the term ISO before? Yeah. Yeah, a couple of you. So it, it, in sort of layperson's terms, it's the sensitivity of our sensor. 
the higher the number, the more sensitive our sensor becomes. And a trade-off is something called noise, which is a grey or mushiness that you'll get in your images. Uh, you've probably seen it before if you've taken a photo at night time on your phones and then you zoom in and it just looks like this absolute mess. Uh, <coughs> we wanted to avoid that as much as possible. So we've got that set to 25. And then we've got our shutter speed. And now basically what I do is just adjust the shutter speed until I get my exposure correct. Uh, I'm going to need to make it slower than what it is at the moment. So let's keep going. And this is where I was talking about like getting to hard caps before. Uh, I've adjusted my shutter speed to one second, which is the longest I can make it, but it's still not enough in these conditions, okay? Um, and you can probably see that it's fairly dark in here at the moment. Uh, but this is why having the brightest light source possible sort of helps you avoid those, um, those pitfalls. What I'm going to do is I'm going to leave my shutter speed on a second, which is as long as it can go, and I'm going to go back to ISO now. That's the only other thing I can change on a smartphone. And I'm just going to keep bumping this up. And we'll see. It's not going to change the brightness. Oh, wait. There we go. It's just a huge lag. So I'm going to keep bumping this up until I can basically start to see that zebra pattern happening like we were seeing before. Once I see that zebra pattern happening, that means I've reached pure white. We want to get as close as possible to pure white without actually reaching. I should say the process for this too is exactly the same if you're photographing something in the wall or if you're photographing something in a gallery. Um, so you're still following all these steps. And it looks like we're reaching pure white in the top left there now. I'm not sure why it's not showing the zebra pattern, but just to keep the demo going smoothly, we're going to not ask too many questions about that at this stage. <laughs> oh, it's showing up a tiny bit um, for me now. So I might bring that back down to around about ISO 40, I think was okay. All right, so now I am ready to take my photo, okay? I'm going to click my little button here, wait five seconds, and it'll take the shot for me. Uh, I did do one other step which I didn't verbally say, and that's click in the middle on the cactus to get my focus. So, okay, so clicking in the middle of the page, whatever object you're shooting, we'll do that for you. Um, cool. So that's the photo done. Right. Next part is doing the editing, and we're getting pretty close to three, so I'm not going to go too much into detail for that, but I'll show you just where to do a basic exposure adjustment, uh, which will probably be the most common thing you need to do. We can see here, this is my photo in the top left that I just took. And you can see this is a little bit of a tricky thing with Lightroom. It looked very different to that when we took the shot. Uh, it didn't look that bright, did it? Um, it doesn't show you a preview, but it's bright, but it's not pure white. I can actually tell that from this thing called the histogram because it's not matched up against the right-hand side. The, there are some technical reasons why you always want to make the photo as bright as possible. Uh, long story short is that you're going to have a cleaner looking image if you capture it to be brighter than if you capture it to be darker. It's always better to darken an image than it is to brighten an image, if that makes sense. Um, and there's some reasons to as to how digital data is stored, as to why that, that is the truth. Um, but it's probably too bright, so I need to fix that. I'm going to go down to the bottom here and scroll to where it says light, which is my exposure adjustments. It'll bring up my exposure sliders, and then I'm just going to slide that basically back just to taste. Okay? As to the right brightness, it does depend a little bit on the environment that you're showing it. So one thing that I always find, like those slides I was showing before with the white backgrounds, I'll always edit a photo, then I put them on the slides, and it looks too dark. And that's because when you put something on a white background, the white background makes it look darker. If you put something on a black background, then it'll make it look brighter. Uh, and the reason why I think that's important to note is that often these will go on websites, uh, go into printed catalogs, like places where you typically have white borders, so often I need to make the photos a little bit brighter than what I think is correct, 
um, but it's worthwhile just having a, a check before you send something off the print or put it on the website, all that sort of thing. Now there are other things I can play around with here, I could bump up the contrast a little bit if I wanted to. I could um, yeah, play around with some of the colour if I thought the colour looked a little bit dull. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but if you want a little bit more of a comprehensive overview, the internet, <coughs> do some uh, research on YouTube. There is one more thing I want to show you. Actually, two more things I want to show you quickly. First one is this geometry option. Um, you, Lightroom is a free app, but if you want this option, you need to pay for it. Um, there is an alternative app that you can use called Snapseed, which will allow you to do it for free, but just makes the whole workflow a little bit more complicated. I use this with pretty much every photo I take of a two-dimensional artwork because I can never get the bloody things square when I take the shot. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's possible at this point because I've been doing, <laughs> taking photos like this for six years or so, um, but it's a very easy fix in Lightroom. There's this thing called geometry <coughs> and... back. This thing called geometry, basically what you do is you click this little button on the right hand side here and then you draw the edges of your painting like so and it squares it all up for you. It's a lifesaver. <coughs> I will say it's a little bit harder to do with your fingers on the app than it is on the computer, um, but with enough care and consideration, you can get it looking pretty square. Uh, so, yeah, use it for pretty much every time I photograph a 2D artwork, and that's definitely not looking square there, but you get the idea. Um, sometimes you can press, uh, we'll have a look and see what the auto does. Yeah. Can you use it on level, like a spirit level? Spirit level will get you square on um, sometimes. The painting still needs to be hung straight though. Uh, you need to be perfectly in front of it because if you're just slightly off to the left or right in the square, yeah. It's, uh, you get it as straight as possible when you're shooting but it's just not always, well, I, in my experience, it's impossible to get it perfect. Um, and you can see there the auto did a <coughs> terrible job. So uh, <laughs> I typically avoid that one. Um, the only other thing I want to show you quickly and conscious that we're up to three o'clock now is that you can't actually do anything with this photo until you get it out of Lightroom. You need to go through something called an export process. So if I want to, where's the photo I just took? If I want to, you put this on a website or on Instagram, send it to a gallery or whatever, I've got to go to, I need to talk 10 seconds behind what I'm actually doing. I need to go to this little square with the arrow at the top there, which is called the export. Then what I would do is go down to export as and choose my file settings. Typically at this point, you want to use a JPEG. You can't do anything with RAW besides look at it in Lightroom. Uh, JPEG is the standard thing to actually put onto websites, send to galleries, whatever. And I go for largest available dimensions. Um, you could reduce the file size at this point and um, change your pixel dimensions or reduce the quality so that it compresses it a bit if you're worried about storage on your phone. Uh, but bigger is generally better for photos. Oh, I think I just exported it. Hang on, let me go through that step again. So I choose my settings and um, then I export the files, export the camera roll, wherever you need to send it. And now if I go have a look at my camera roll, there's my photo ready to use. So I might leave it there for the official part of the talk and I'm going to show you one more slide just so you can take a photo of all those um, Lightroom steps if you would like. But are there any questions? Um, is... well, I think the gentleman was just slightly quicker than you putting up his hand. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go with yours first. A uh, couple of quick things. There's another little trick which you can try for product you can get, which is like a, a diffusing sheet. Yes. Uh, you can put that between the light source and the subject, and that will really help with reflections, two different reflections. Yeah. 
similar sort of thing to what the, the diffuser does. Yeah. And you actually just remind me of something else too. Quite a, um, often people use uh, these light tents. I don't know if anyone's seen them. They're like cloth cubes. Uh, I have a personal disdain for those things. The reason being is that when you have perfectly even illumination like a light tent creates, you lose the, the depth and the character from the shadows. Uh, shadows, people get worried about shadows, but shadows are a good thing. Shadows are what makes things look three-dimensional. Um, and you just don't get any control with a light tent, so they make things easy, but they also give you worse results than what we've sort of talked about today. Well, just, well, and the thing, second thing was, uh, do you have anything to say to everyone here about um, how you would handle depth of field or depth of focus? Don't need to worry about it with a phone camera because aperture's locked. Um, you'll pretty much always have uh, everything sharp, um, except if you're photographing objects because you're, um, the only thing that's going to change uh, your depth of field is your distance to your subject. Um, so what, what, um, sorry, what was your name? Mark. What Mark was talking about is the third part of exposure, which I didn't talk about because we can't change it on our phones, uh, which is aperture. And the best sort of visual explanation I get, everyone's familiar with a photo, uh, a portrait where you have the subject sharp, the background or blurry. Um, that's controlled by the aperture. Uh, but phones, because they have small sensors, typically everything is sharp. That's why on a lot of modern phones they have those portrait modes where the they, blur thing. yeah. So that's all done computationally. Whereas with a dedicated camera system, you do it with the hardware. Um, so yeah, don't don't worry about it. Essentially, it's my that's my very long answer for <laughs> this. Don't worry about it. What was your question? Just really basic. Like, is it better to have paper that goes like that than one that has? It just depends on the look that you yeah. want. Um, if you like that seamless and yeah, sort of like yeah, we call them um, a seamless backdrop, or uh, if they're full size, you call them a cyclorama. But if you like this yeah. sort of look here, then you want to have a curve, uh, and the curve doesn't like really need to be that dramatic either. It just needs to not have a, a hard line, uh, and you'll get that kind of look. Another good way to do that is um, you have the cardboard box and you cut out. Side, yeah, sure. Paper, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then have the card. Yeah. Great DIY. Yeah. Make it with tissue paper and cardboard. And probably, like, <laughs> I sort of assumed everyone has a space that they can just tape things to walls <laughs> like that in my studio, uh, which is probably a bad assumption to make because uh, I know certainly when I've worked at home before, you know, you can't just put a bunch of gaffer tape or drill holes in the walls <laughs> and not think about it too much. So, yeah, um, great DIY tip. Uh, anything else that I didn't cover? Yeah. Where did you get these? Just from a photo, store. a photo store. Yeah, well, Amazon and have them too. Uh, if you buy cheap ones, they can have a little bit of a colour cast to them. Mm -hmm. Like this one, I think this one is super, super old too. It's a little bit it's a yellow, it's yellowy. Mm -hmm. um, but as long as you're doing your white balancing with your grey card, then you just neutralise any colour cast that they have. So um, you can save a little bit of money on that sort of thing. So uh, generally for this too, you want to match about the, the size of the diffuser to the size of the artwork. So you know, if you're photographing a really big painting, metre by metre and a half painting, then you need something a lot bigger than this. Um, I could probably get away with a small diffuser for an object like this here, but um, yeah, sort of err on the side of bigger, I suppose. Uh, you'll get more use out of it. Um, but yeah, you can also use like a little bit of, you, you were talking about sort of like some tissue paper or something when you um, made your, your point four for the diffuser? Or dedicated like um, diffusion yeah. screen, yeah. No, I was talking about, um, you can actually get sheets, A3, A4 sheets of diffuser paper. It's not diffuser, it's uh, polarising paper. Yeah. Or sheet. Yeah. And you can actually rotate it and then it just cuts down the reflections on the Sure, surfaces. yeah. Um, so that's sort of getting into the cross polarization realm as well. But they're cheap, um, they're like 20 bucks. Yeah, okay, great. Um, you can buy diffusion paper as well, or just use tracing paper. I mean, I've even used um, white office paper before if your light's bright enough. Um, just something translucent and, um, uh, yeah, white. What's the technical name given to that? Is it a screen or...? Uh, for the backdrop? Yeah. Seamless. A seamless backdrop. Seamless backdrop. Yeah, seamless, seamless backdrop, cyclorama is um, 
a full size one that you can do portraits in. Um, a scrim is something, a term used for something that you put in between a light source and the object. So um, something like a diffuser is a kind of scrim. Yeah. The, uh, the black card, like when I was talking about holding the black card there and casting the shadow, you call that a go-by, which tends to go between. Okay. All these wonderful <laughs> terms, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah um, mean nothing until someone tells you. <laughs> uh, any other questions? If someone doesn't have a telephoto option on their phone, mm. how do you get handled the power storage? Yeah. So in Lightroom, there is an option uh, to do enable lens corrections, which will help a little bit with the distortion. Um, that'll help with things like, yeah, barrel distortion, like you mentioned. It's not going to help with the distortion you get from shooting with a wide angle, and that's stretching out the appearance of depth. Because uh, wide angle lenses make things that are distant appear closer, and things that are further away appear further. Uh, they are really kind of hard to shoot with, like if you don't have a telephoto lens on your phone and you're wanting a seamless look like this, you would need a huge bit of paper. Um, because by the time you get close enough to fill the frame with your object, you're basically seeing you know, everything around the paper, um, as well as the object too. Uh, that reminds me, I keep thinking of extra tips. Um, you never really want to zoom in. You know how you can do like a pinch and drag zoom on your phones? Uh, there's not really any reason to do that, because what that does is it, rather than zooming with optical elements, it just digitally zooms, which effectively is just cropping in on the, pic, uh, the picture. Um, so, you know, if you need to do that, just do it in post-production. There's not really any benefit to doing it in camera. You're just losing resolution and losing quality. Anything else? Yeah, this is really basic. Um, about the composition of 3D objects. Sure. You've got it lower on the page. Yeah. So that's, um, I know it's not supposed to be dead center, but you? This reminded me, I, got an, I put in an extra slide this morning that I forgot about too. Um, <laughs> cover placement and composition. Uh, you know, like two classic rules, rule of thirds, um, you might have heard it before, and, you know, um, like it's got ratios and sort of fancier versions of it too, but uh, typically all my photos will be loosely based around the rule of thirds. In that cactus shot, uh, we've sort of got like the heaviest bit of the photo in that lower third there, and then it sits within the middle third. Um, I think it's often best to give objects room to breathe. When you get in really tight on things, then it can just feel a little bit claustrophobic. Uh, this is also more of a minimalist kind of look, which is a little bit more contemporary too. So I like to just frame things a little bit further back. Uh, but, you know, that's somewhat of a subjective choice. Um, the other thing, too, if you're shooting in galleries, is just using lines to direct the eye. So with this photo here, like if I cut the photo off like that and just captured that one wall on the left-hand side, what happens is these strong lines from the wall push our eye in this direction. And if the photo ended there, we just keep going off the edge of the photo. Um, but by having two diagonals moving into each other, our eyes keep getting pushed to this point and it contains our eyes within the frame. So that's another trick um, that's useful to use when you're composing images. Uh, but you, you don't think about that so much when you're doing object-based stuff. Um, it's more to do with maybe light, light placement and the angle of the object. Um, yeah, not that there. Cool. Anything else? Great. <laughs> Good. Uh, thanks for coming along.